All right, Luke 13 again, we're dealing with this uh, passage that Jesus is talking about whenever the people were killed, um, not only by Pilate, but by when the tower fell. And he issued a warning to them. Notice what he says in verse 3. I tell you, nay, that didn't happen because they were worse sinners than you. But except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Okay, now what he's saying is, you're no different than them. And the temporary thing that happened to them is going to happen to all people permanently unless they repent. Now I want you all to notice he didn't say, believe, did he? He said, repent. Now come down to verse 5. I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, we have a repentless gospel in our country today. I, I probably read y'all the quote from William Booth. In the late 1800s, the founder of the Salvation Army, which was a, a real Christian, you know, thing at, at first. But he said that his biggest fear, he thought the biggest concern in our country for the 20th century, the 1900s, would be a repentless gospel, a Christless church, church without Christ, the gospel without repentance. You know, and he went on a long thing, and we've got it. And the reason is because, y'all know, people... People don't want to talk about sin and people don't want to act about or talk about turning from sin and what happens is the word works becomes a dirty word nobody's promoting salvation by works and people say well if you preach any kind of works you're preaching salvation by works no we can't be saved by our works but saving faith always comes along with works it's what Martin Luther said we're saved by faith alone but saving faith is never alone and so you, you got to be careful because people today, as soon as you bring up sin or work, say, well, if you're worried about that, you're not trusting Christ. No, that's not true. The truth is that repentance is the core of the gospel. Now, it's not something that you and I of our own selves do and then God rewards it. It's not. But we're not without responsibility. God enables us and we respond in that ability. In other words, God grants repentance. And what do me and you do? We repent. Okay, now there's something to repentance, but y'all go over to Matthew 3, but there's something to it I want to show y'all. But in Matthew 3, we've got a, a, the same statement here. John the Baptist is baptizing people and of course they're coming down and getting baptized and he looks up one day and there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, were there any Pharisees saved? Yes. But what could they not continue to be if they're saved? A Pharisee. It's impossible. You can't be self-righteous and saved. You've got to lay that aside, right? Were there any Sadducees saved? We don't have any record of any. They didn't believe in the spirit, afterlife of angels. They didn't believe in afterlife. What's going to be their, their cause for salvation, right? I'm not saying there weren't any, but we don't have record of any. We do have record of Pharisees that got saved. But the Pharisees start coming down. And in verse 7 it says, But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, O children of the snake, are they? Yeah. All lost people are. O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, what wrath is he referring to ultimately? The wrath of God. He says, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Fruits fit for repentance. Bring forth fruits matching repentance. In other words, don't just say it, let me see it. Next verse. Think not to say within yourselves. We have, in other words, talk is cheap. Now, this repentance shows itself in the Bible, but it's much more than what people make it out to be. And we'll just do it down here. Okay, to repent. It actually involves three things. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because the whole human being is involved in salvation. Paul said he prayed our whole body, mind, and spirit be blameless at the presence of the Lord. He sure didn't mean this body, did he? But he also said in another time that the Romans had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered them. How does it start? Doctrine comes to our head. Teaching, the Word, Gospel, faith is produced. Then what happens? The heart is moved. They obeyed from the heart. You can obey not from the heart, just formalism. But he says they obeyed. That's physical. You see, words came, it moved their heart, and their heart was truly moved, and that showed in that what? They changed what they were doing. 
And so salva or salvation, which, which again, the fruit of it is repentance, starts with confession. Okay? Now, I don't mean confession in the sense of Roman Catholicism. I mean that we confess. What do we confess? Our sin and our sins. Now, this is important. We don't just confess our sins. And I'm not saying you've got to confess every one. We don't even know all of them. What I mean is I've got to confess that I am constantly, in my, by my own will and desires, transgressing against God's law. But I've also got to know something else. I've got a sin nature that even when I'm not openly transgressing, transgressing against Him, I'm still a sinner, ain't I? So I know that I am cut off from God, not only by my actions, but by my nature. And to confess that means to acknowledge that openly to God. And to men too. I mean, you don't hide it, but you come to the realization that in your mind you realize something, I am guilty in the eyes of God. Right? But then it brings the second part. Now, what happens after the confession? <clears throat> Lots of people will acknowledge to you that they're a sinner. Lots of people acknowledge to you they've been that way all their life and they're rotten. Lots of people laugh about it, don't they? To truly repent then involves contrition. Okay, and when I say contrition, I mean before God, not before men. Now let me show y'all why I say that. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. Now contrition is not just fear. Okay? It's not. Look, every Roman Catholic is in fear of hell. That's not necessarily contrition. Contrition is, starts with fear. But where does it ultimately lead to when we begin to see what we are by nature? You begin to look at God in a different way, don't we? We begin to see that my offenses aren't just against my neighbor. This is, I'm unclean in the sight of God. And then somebody tells you that Jesus Christ died because of that. And how does that make you feel? You begin to realize why our Savior died. You begin to realize, I caused it. I put Him on that cross. And so the contrition is before God. Now in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says, uh, uh, if I could, you know what, I'm giving you all the wrong chapter. I think it's 7. Yeah, I'm sorry. In 2 Corinthians 7, Paul had written, uh, written, written, sorry, Maddie, written. <laughs> Paul had written the Corinthians a letter, and it was, 1 Corinthians was a harsh letter. Lots of correction, lots of rebuke in it. Well, he writes this letter of 2 Corinthians to him, and he says this in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. He said, Though I made you sorry with a letter, and he did, and I mean, he, he brought them to remorse with the letter, I do not repent. I don't change my mind. I don't turn from what I said or did, though I did repent. There was a while there when he was second-guessing what he had done because he hadn't hurt, seen Titus and he was concerned he had been too harsh on him. Y'all know how we do. You spank your kid and then how do you feel? Oh, should I? Was it too much? You know. And he says, For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. I know I made you sorry and sad, but it was temporary. He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. He said, I'm thankful. Now, it was hard for a while what I did and what I went through, and I know it was hard on you, but today I'm thankful for it. For, or because, ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. He, they saw what they had done was an offense, not just to Paul, but to God, right? And Paul says, that's good. Next verse. For or because godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Now look, this isn't just salvation from hell. This is salvation from all sin. Look, you and I have certain sins that we're tempted by and we fight. And when we're honestly and sincerely not just sorry that we keep doing it or sorry that we got caught or sorry that there's some... When we're honestly asking God, please, this is an offense to you. I know you would not have me. To, Lord, help me. What does He do? 
He helps us turn from it. So He not only grants us the repentance for initial salvation, folks, He's there to do this with every sin. So He says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. In other words, that's good. You don't need to turn from that. He says, But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now what's the sorrow of the world? Yeah, well, it's when you're sorry you got caught. Sorry people saw you. It's the public apologies politicians issue all the time, right? It's, uh, it's Drew Brees. Now look, I liked Drew Brees. He was a great quarterback. I think he's probably a Christian. I don't know him, but things I've heard him say seem like a sincere Christian. Uh, I've been told that his tight end, the one that they cut off on TV when he started talking about the gospel, remember that time? Uh, what was his name? Watson, I think. He was on TV and they were talking about all the problems and he told that lady on CNN, he said, no, he said, that's not the problem. The problem is sin, ma'am. He said, we're all sinners and we need the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sin. And all of a sudden, it scream went fuzzy and the lady said, oh, we lost connection. Remember that? Y'all know what happened. I've been told that he shared the gospel with Drew Brees and I pray that's so. But Drew Brees made a statement about all the kneeling for the national anthem. Remember when all that started in the football games? Mm -hmm. And Drew Brees simply said the truth. He said, no, I never kneeled for the national anthem. You know, my grandpa fought in World War II. I respect that, don't y'all? Mm -hmm. But what happened? Backlash. Mm -hmm. Political backlash, political correctness started attacking him. And so he come out and issued a statement of contrition and remorse. Folks, he was not contrite. He was wanting to kill the, the you know. Y'all know how these public apologies are. That's not any type of true contrition. It's just sorrow that the effect the world is. We know what I mean, right? Okay. So what is true contrition then? It's before God. It's when nobody's looking. It's when we do or think a thing or don't do a thing we ought to and we realize we're by ourselves and we just realize I have once again offended my Savior. I've once again fallen short. And how does it make you feel? They make you feel awful. Why? Because he died for me. I just committed another sin, and that's one of the sins that put him on the cross. He felt the pain of that sin on the cross. So it's contrition. But it doesn't end with contrition. Where does it go from there? Change. It's one thing to confess I've done something wrong. It's another thing to be honestly sorry but if I just keep on doing it, I'm not really, you see? Now, I'm not saying that you're going to change and be done with that forever. To change doesn't necessarily mean I'm never going to commit that sin again. It means I have right now in my contrition turned from that. I do not want to serve this anymore. I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It just shows us that the whole mind, heart, and person is involved in salvation. And they're also involved in repentance. If repentance falls short in one of these, it's not biblical repentance. We've got tons of examples in Scripture, don't we? Don't we have example after example of people that profess to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And when it requires that they be contrite and acknowledge that they're sinners like the Gentiles, what did most of the Jews do? They departed. When it required a change, what did they do? They weren't willing. Y'all know we, we see this all the time. He I recently talking with someone that, that said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm in trouble and I realize this and I'm this and that and I want to do different and I want to do better. Okay, that's good. I'm not proud of this. I need to get right with God. Okay, but if it comes down to the point that it means I got to quit drinking beer, I ain't going to do it. Now, look, I'm not picking on the person. I've heard this many times. Some people say, if I got to quit smoking, whoever told you you got to quit drinking or smoking to be a Christian? Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't say it anywhere. It says don't be a drunkard. It, if you're a preacher, it's... Make your body a temple to Christ. Well, it does, but on that, on that basic foundation, if we're going to use that, who eats at McDonald's or Burger King or eats sugar, mm -hmm. right? He, the point being is people put the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. I tried to explain to him, look, you're thinking that you've got to do this in order for God to save you. Mm -hmm. The truth is if you'll just cry out for God to save you, then God will begin to cause you to do these things. Mm -hmm. They're the fruit of salvation. They're not the cause of it. I mean, don't y'all know, everybody in here has got certain pet sins, don't we? Mm -hmm. And you struggle with those sins all your life, and you get saved, and what happens? 
You're still struggling with those sins. You've still got the same personality and you're still struggling. You say, well, where's the change? The change is in the desire, isn't it? Did you used to be concerned about them for the sake of God? No. It used to be, you know, look, I, I struggle with eating. I mean, I'm an eater. Boy, I live to eat. I come from a, on one side, I come from a family of eaters, right? And so I live to eat. The other side eats to live. I would rather be that way. I'm not, so I struggle with eating. Now, to my defense, okay, I'm blaming Trish. I'm blaming Gina. I'm blaming Karen, and I'm especially blaming Kathy, right? <laughs> the whole idea is whatever your personality is, it's not going to change. What's going to change is your desire to serve God, and little by little, what begins to happen to these things? Little by little, they begin to come into perspective. You might battle them to the day you die, but you are battling, aren't you? You've got to pay attention to it more. You, you don't. And, and, and you can say, you know, I joke with y'all about, uh, you know, being fat. And honestly, I know I'm not morbidly obese. When the doctor told me about the weight loss drug, Lexi said, well, I mean, you're not that fat. Right. Right? <laughs> but if I, if I honestly thought that, that I was eating to the point that it was ungodly, then yeah, I need to do something about it. I really don't believe I am. I mean, I know I could cut back, right? But are there things you and I do that we know, point blank, this is not what a Christian should do? Aren't there? How do you feel when you do it? Contrition. Do you feel contrite because a brother or sister in Christ knows? Now, I don't like that they know. I especially feel contrition when my sin has affected them and caused them to sin. You know, lots of people will do things because they see a preacher or a teacher do it and think it's okay. But where it really hits home is this. When I realize that the, the light I'm supposed to be let shine before the world has caused someone to not want the Lord Jesus Christ because of what they've seen in me, now that is a horrible feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Contrition before God is, God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, bought me with a price, I'm His slave, and I realize I'm not serving Him as I ought to. Now when we realize that, what do we do? We sincerely turn and, and begin. Now, you might turn back and fall not long after, but what do you do? You repent again and you go. Charles Spurgeon said, repentance is a lifelong issue. Yeah. I believe we are always repenting, aren't we? Yeah. It's because we're always turning and falling. That's true salvation always involves repentance, okay? I'm going to read y'all a couple things that I, someone had quoted in a, in a book that I thought was really good. All right. Uh, let's see. I say that now I can't even find it. <laughs> Let me see. I thought I put it in my notes. Uh, it's from the Westminster Confession is what I wanted to read to you all, what it says. But the Westminster Confession, by the way, is a confession that the, um, during the uh, Reformation that the Presbyterian Church wrote up. All the different churches wrote up a confession of faith, what they believe, and it really put it really good, but no, I can't even find it in my own notes. Uh, we are all sinners, all in need of repentance, all deserving of punishment, all preserved from the wrath of God, at least until Judgment Day, purely by His mercy. We in no way have merited anything from God. Isn't that good? Okay, now there's another one here. Let me find it. Mm, okay, here's the Westminster Confession of Faith. Summarizes that repentance is this. A sinner, out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and od odiousness of his sins, as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God, so grieves for and hates his sins as to turn from them all unto God, proposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. In other words, you leave nothing back. You don't say, I want to walk with Christ except for this couple things. I'm going to... You honestly want to walk with Him. You fall away in these things, but you want to walk with Him. The desire is sincere. And there's one other I wanted to read y'all. A fellow named Henry said, <clears throat> Philip Henry says this, Some people do not like to hear much of repentance. 
But I think it so necessary that if I should die in the pulpit, I should desire to die preaching repentance. And if I should die out of the pulpit, I should, die, I should desire to die practicing repentance. Isn't that really well said? And it's not, again, what the world has made it. The American churches have turned repentance into, if you will quit drinking, smoking, gambling, chasing women, then you can be saved. Folks, that's not repentance. Where are you going to end with that list? I mean, who picked them things anyway? You know, there's certain churches, they say, you can't dance. David danced before the Lord, didn't he? Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's other churches say, you can't, no, who makes this list of things? I mean, y'all, man, mm -hmm. each denomination has their pet peeves. Mm -hmm. You know, with one group, with the Episcopalians, boy, it's smoking it was at one time. Smoking, that was it. Boy, it wasn't with the Baptists. They used to say in the old days, you located a Baptist church, you look for the cloud of smoke. You, right? I mean, Charles Spurgeon was a Baptist and smoked his cigars right until the day he died, didn't he? I love when someone called him on it. He said, well, why? I'm a gardener. He said, I, when I have weeds, I burn them. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being is each one of these little pet peeves, since we always jokingly say drinking, smoking, gang, you know, just to make an issue. But if there's something that you think you have to do to be eligible to be saved, you don't understand salvation. Salvation is there's nothing I can do. I'm not eligible and I never will be eligible. But my Savior has done something. My Savior has paid for the filth and the, and the horror of my sin in order to reconcile me to God. He brings me to the table whereby God grants me repentance and begins sanctifying me and little by little these things begin to fall away. The sin becomes the excuse. It, it does for sure. Yeah, you got it. And if you think, and look, I feel for people in this condition because they're trying to fight against some urge without God, and you can't do it. Without God's help, you can't. Whatever that urge is that you have, everybody's different. You're trying to overcome that in your own power, and you can't, so you finally arrive at the conclusion, if I've got to quit this to be saved, I'm not going to be saved. That's why the person you know, that I was telling you about told me, well, if it means quit drinking my beer, I can't. Or I won't. Now, in all reality, if you make the statement, well, I'd like to be, but I'm going to do this, what you're really saying is, in the big scheme of things, if it requires me to stop this, then I'd rather go to hell. Isn't that what we're saying? Okay. But if I think it does require me to quit this in my own power, I'm going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. So where's the, where's the middle at? Where's the fine line? The fine line is get your mind off the specifics of the sins and say this, I am holy without uh, any merit before God and I desire to be right with my Savior. I desire to be right with God. With all my heart, I can't do anything about what I am, but I want to be right with God. And then what happens? God will get you the God and you'll get and He'll make you right. He'll grant you repentance. And so we've got to depend on Him. All right, let's look at the specifics with the time we got left. <clears throat> By the way, repentance is the message of every single Old Testament prophet, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Every one of them went to Israel. I don't care which one it is, and if you read their writings, ultimately is you better turn back to God. Okay? Um, uh, and the fig tree in our case here was planted in the vineyard, something I need to bring out. The vineyard is where you planted grapes. Right? In an arbor with a vineyard. You don't plant trees in a vineyard, but that's not unusual. They planted fruit trees in the vineyard close to their house for their own personal use because the vineyard is where they had the protection, it's where they had the best soil, and where they gave the most care. For instance, if you plant a tree, a fruit tree, in your vineyard and it don't produce fruit, has it got any excuse? Was Israel put in the optimum position? Yeah. Were they given God's word? Were they given, I mean, the knowledge of what they had done? And they had every reason in the world to worship God, didn't they? Who has more reason and more responsibility? We do. You got a whole Bible in front of you. You've got the explanation in the New Testament of what Israel saw through a veil in the old, don't we? We have no excuse for not bringing forth fruit. All right, so let's go back and look at it. Um, verse 1, back in uh, Luke 13, he says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And again, we have no other account of this. But let me ask y'all, would these Galileans had gone to the feast if they knew they were going to be killed? We don't know, do we? 
Probably not, but you know something? They should have. Didn't the law tell them three times a year to go? Yeah. You know, in that case, they had every reason to go even if they were going to be killed, didn't they? It's be like this. Would me and you go to church if we thought there was a threat of persecution? Mm -hmm. Would me and you do what we're, we're told to do? We better learn to. We better get serious about what we're I'm not trying to beat y'all with church at I'm just saying, are you and I going to remain faithful? Now, in the other case, would they have gone up that tower or been next to that tower? I wouldn't have. Nothing in the Word of God told me I needed to go up that tower, stand by that tower. But there is something in the Word of God that told him they have to go to Jerusalem, wasn't there? So there are cases where you and I do help ourselves or keep ourselves from persecution. And there are other cases where you and I are open to it. How do we make that decision? Based on the Word of God. For instance, the Word of God says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. What's that mean? It means don't quit meeting. You know, that's why they gave John MacArthur so much trouble in California during coronavirus. Y'all know California is a communist state. I mean, it, they're the furthest advanced in this thing. They threatened to shut off their electricity and their water. Why? They didn't, they didn't control it. They didn't threaten to do that to Walmart. They didn't do it to anybody else. They didn't even threaten to do it to the Roman Catholic Church. They threatened to do it to him, his church. Why? Because he's been a thorn in their side for years. Yep. Well, what's, what do you mean? Is he abrasive? No, yep. he's abrasive to them. Yep. He won't quit preaching the gospel. I thank God for that man. I'm going to tell you all, when that man dies, it looks like his health's turning. That's a great judgment on our country, especially on those people out there. That, is, that man has been a, a great witness for the truth of God's Word. No matter what they say, he sticks to it. I'm thankful for people like that. All right, now verse 2. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Again, what he's basically saying is, okay, you're looking at it and you're not seeing it right. You think this happened to them because they were worse than others. You need to quit even thinking that way. You need to say, why do events like this happen at all? And why do events like this happen? Sin. Would there be any death in the world if it wasn't for Adam's sin? Would there be any harm, any tears, any heartache? So rather than look at their sins, we need to look at man's sin, don't we? Who's that include? Me. So I need to know that the things that happen in my life, I don't go blaming God for them. I blame me for them. Now, even if it's good for me, lots of times I bring it on myself. Right? Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. Was that good? Was it a sin? Yes. Did it turn out to be even for their own benefit? That's not saying that they didn't realize what they were doing, but they were doing good. No. It's saying that God is so omnipotent and sovereign that God took even that evil desire and made it work out to their good, didn't He? That's what we're dealing with. All right, now, verse 3. I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, it's only by God's grace that we hadn't all been destroyed. So he says, Those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all perish. He's using these two things to tell them something. These events come on everybody, ultimately, you know, some men's sins go before them and some follow after, don't they? But will everybody stand before the Lord? Yes. Yeah, we will. All right, now let's move on to, because we, we've talked enough about that, but let's move on to the second thing, this parable. Now, in the first part, the part we just read, the message really is be converted, isn't it? But in this second one, it's be converted now. The first is be converted, and the second one is do not delay. Okay? Let's read the parable. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Israel's pictured as a fig tree over and over in the Old Testament. A fig tree you plant to bring forth fruit. Okay? He says, it's planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. I want you all to notice that. He didn't find little fruit. He found none. If he had found a fig, could you say that tree was fruitless? No. You remember when Peter, and they, they were in the boat and they all thought they were drowning? Mm -hmm. Did he say, O ye of zero faith, no, O ye of little faith? I am so thankful that little faith is faith, isn't it? He found none, zero. 
I'm, I'm driving this point home because, look, we live in a day and age of, of spiritual barrenness where literally our fruit is nothing compared to what it was in the old days. But do you see some actual fruit in your life? Folks, we, we need to examine it and see. And we don't need to say, am I putting on a show or doing this or that? Do I see actual fruit of repentance and sanctification? So he says now, then said he to the dresser of his vineyard. Now, who do y'all suppose in the analogy the dresser would be? Christ. The, the father says, away with it. And all of a sudden, somebody steps in. It says, the vine dresser of the vineyard said, behold. Or the dresser of the vineyard said, behold. These three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down while cumbereth at the ground. And he answering, the certain man, Christ, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. So God passes judgment. And what happens? Christ steps in. You remember in the Old Testament in Exodus 32 when Israel had broken all ten commandments with the golden calf? And God told Moses, stand back Moses, I'll destroy them all. Now, what did Moses do? He stood in the gap, it says, a type of Christ. So Christ intercedes. You know, it's a shame when you read uh, dispensational commentaries, and I used to do the same thing myself, so I'm not picking on them. All their comments and all their thoughts about this passage are about the three years. They're trying to figure out the three years. What's it apply to? When was it? And all. Wouldn't it be a shame to try and figure out what these three years were and miss the point? Mm -hmm. he, Sully knows what I mean. We have friends that are always laying out time and figuring when this started and when that began. Folks, that stuff's fruitless. The idea is don't get, lose the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. The three years probably has to do with Christ's three-year ministry, I would suspect. Now, his ministry was three and a half years long, right? And he started it around the time of tabernacles. We know that because of his age and lots of things you can say because he died at Passover. If I go three years from Passover, where will I be at? If this is Passover, if I jump forward 365 days, what day will it be? Passover. If I go another one, what will it be? Yes. Passover. If I go six months, what will it be? Tabernacles. Tabernacles. And so basically Christ is saying, these three years I've come unto them, give it this year also. And the this year doesn't mean let's give it another 365 days. He means gives it, get, let's give it the remainder of the year. And remember the Jews' year goes to Passover, starts and goes. So give them what's left. Give them the remainder. Now, did Christ preach to these people ongoing for three and a half years? Yes. What was the message always starting with? The first word. Repent. The kingdom is at hand. Okay, so he says he's going to do something. He said, I'm going to dig about it and dung it. Now, I'm not very familiar with the dig about it part. Maybe Gina and Lexi might be. I don't know. But he, he said basically what, the, what they say about it is this. You, you loosen the soil around the roots. You, you break the hard soil. In other words, it's not getting what it needs to it. So you break up the soil. You loosen it. I am familiar with when Lexi plants something. It's in a big root ball. What do you do with it? You, you loosen up the root ball so it can do. It can be constrained. It cannot be getting. What, what he's saying is I'm going to break its roots free from the earth, from the hard earth, and then I'm going to pour in what it needs. Now, y'all think about that. What did Christ do after the cross? He sent that, that. He did that. He poured out the Spirit. And for another three and a half years, according to Daniel, if look, I'm, again, I don't want to get lost in the time and make the mistake I just said about, but Christ's ministry back here is three and a half years. But he said in Daniel that he would die in the middle of the 70th week. He would be cut off. What does that leave? Half a week, another three and a half years. And he said the prophecy was concerning Daniel's people, Judah, and Daniel's city, Jerusalem. What happened after the cross? The twelve apostles do what? They go to the temple and they start preaching. And where do you find them? They're in the temple preaching nonstop. And the church is growing, growing, growing. And finally we get over here to a point and what happens? They held a national council meeting and they stoned Stephen to death, don't they? And then what happened? It left Daniel's city and Daniel's people. The next thing you read is they go to Samaria. 
And then we got an Ethiopian eunuch saved, don't we? And then we got Paul saved, and then Cornelius. So I suspect, and I wouldn't argue with anybody over it, I don't know, but I suspect that the three years, give it this year also, the remainder, and then he says, I'm going to do these things. So what Christ basically is saying is, I've got a tree here that is in, a, it's in, it's in the best condition. It ought to be uh, doing all these things, and it's not. And you say, cut it down, but I say, stop. Don't cut it down yet. Let's give it further effort. Let's give it further incentive. Whose ministry begins after the cross? The Holy Spirit. Y'all know, really and truly, that tree did produce fruit. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, what happened? 3,000 Jews that had cried crucify him were saved, weren't they? Aren't you, aren't you thankful that tree wasn't cut down? Yeah. And then it goes on. So he does know what he's doing, but he says after that, notice, in uh, verse... Uh, Nine, if it bear fruit well, if not, then after that shall thou shalt cut it. He don't say how long after that. After that thou shalt cut it down. What happened to the, those people? They were cut off, folks. They were not only cut off, their religion was visibly destroyed. The temple was wiped out. The city was destroyed. They couldn't practice Judaism if they wanted to. It's absolutely impossible. You know, Jews in New York City, Orthodox Jews, sacrifice chickens in their kitchens. Where's the law say to do that? You see how hopeless that situation is? And somehow, yet they think God's going to honor it. If God wouldn't honor Moses and them doing the sacrifices he ordained, why would God accept a chicken in a kitchen? Yeah. You see, it's, it's, I know it sounds fool, you know, foolish to do it to us, but why did God want a sacrifice in the first place? For the blood of the sacrifice? For what it testified to? It was the preaching of the gospel. Why would God want a sacrifice today? He doesn't. Troy, I heard a new phrase, sacrificial prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can do instead of the chicken. That's right. You got it, Sully. That's what we're to offer. We're to offer the sacrifice of our lips. That's prayer, isn't it? It's thankfulness. It's glorifying the Lord. It's sharing the gospel. We're to offer our lives a living sacrifice. In other words, we don't offer those physical things. We serve Christ, and our service is our sacrifice. And you know, when you get done making your sacrifice, what you say? I've only done what is, what is expected of me. He said, when a slave comes in out the field and has done everything the master told him to do, does the master brag on him and tell him, oh, you're so special? He said, no. He tells him, now get my dinner. He said, so do you and I think. When we've done everything the Lord's told us to do, still consider ourselves unprofitable servants. You feel that way about yourself? Boy, I do. I, when I think about Judgment Day, I don't think about all I've got coming. I don't think that way at all. I think about all the loss and the wasted time. That's, that's what comes across my mind. I'm thankful when I hear other preachers say the same thing. I heard a man like R.C. Sproul. He said when he stand now this guy served the Lord a lot. I mean, a lot of people have been edified by his ministry. He said his first thought when he thinks of the judgment of God, so it scares him and he tries not to think about it, is all the rounds of golf he played. Is there anything wrong with playing golf? It's not a sin. What he's saying is, I could have been doing more in Christ. Right? That, that's the kind of thing we ought to think. Jesus said, in your own estimation of yourself, unprofitable servants. He said in the next uh, case, though, he said, when I come back, he said, whatever you've done with what I've given you, even if you did one thing, just a little thing, I'll tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. Y'all see where the difference is? Let him do the judging. Let him keep the score. He said in, in Luke 14, when someone invites you to a wedding or a feast, don't go sit in the best seat. Go sit in the very back of the room, and when he comes in, if he wants to move you higher, he'll move you higher. Otherwise, he said, you sit down in the front of the room, and you're going to be awfully disappointed when he comes and kicks you out of that chair and puts somebody else there. Y'all see what the picture is? The picture is our own estimation of ourself and our service. I would tell you, don't keep score. Don't keep score. I had a man tell me one time, there were whatever the number was, I've, I've saved this many people. And I said, none of them are saved then. Not a one. You've never saved anybody. All you and I have ever done has been used of the Lord if we've done anything in the Lord. And what more could be expected from slaves? 
Okay? Israel was God's redeemed slaves, and what did they do? They rebelled against Him. And so in this parable of the fig tree, it really comes down in the end to this. Christ interceding, just like Moses, God uh, surrendering to His intercession, being moved by the intercession, Christ interceding, bearing fruit or not bearing fruit, He said, I'll cut it down. Now in the case of Israel, on the, two days before Christ dies, I think it was on that Monday, He comes riding down the hill into town, and He passes the next morning a fig tree. Y'all remember that? He saw a fig tree in the distance, and the fig tree was full of leaves, right? A fig tree in Israel, as it grows, the leaves and the fruit grow together. They're, they're different than ours. They look different, everything, but the figs and the leaves grow together because a fig technically is a flower. I don't know if y'all know, the, the flower's on the inside. That's what that is inside it. Y'all look it up. I'm no botanist, but you look it up, and it's interesting. All right? So as the leaves are growing, the fruit's growing. When you see a big green fig tree, huge covered in leaves in the Middle East, what do you think? Figs. The Lord come up looking for that tree. Now I know he knew what he was doing. He walked up to that tree and it had leaves but no fruit. What does this amount to? An outward profession of religion. An outward profession of faith. Where's the fruit? And you know what the Lord did? He cursed it. He said you will never bring forth fruit again. Now they didn't think about that. They went on their way. The next morning they come walking by and what do they see? That fig tree is dead down to the roots. I mean, dead, cursed. That's a picture of Israel. But let's not leave it with that before we quit. Israel back here, okay, was represented by a fig tree. Other times they were represented by a vine and other pictures, right? So Israel, the fig tree is a type of Israel. Does that make sense? But over here, what's Israel ultimately a type of? Church. Okay. So the type had a type, didn't it? The fig tree was a picture of Israel, and Israel's a picture of the church. What do we have in Israel? A whole bunch of people professing to be Abraham's seed and a remnant that are saved. Does that sound familiar? What do we have in the church? Folks, we got a big old fig tree in all the world. Jesus said that it would go so big, the kingdom would get so big, it would be like a mustard tree. And he said, in that mustard tree, the fowls of the air would lodge. Fowls of the air aren't something good. Okay, they're devils in the parables. So essentially what we deal with is we've got a visible church like we had a visible Israel. And Paul said, not all Israel is Israel. We've got a visible church, don't we? What's the true mark of the people in the church that are the church, the body of Christ? Christ, Fruit. Does that make sense? And what is the clearest fruit you can identify? Repentance. Okay. Is that, I hope that's clear. I didn't bump or muddle that up for y'all. All right. Any questions? No? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord then. Our Father, we thank You for the clear teaching of Your Scripture. Lord, please take these things and help us. Give us the will, the desire, and the power to put them into practice. Lord, grant us a full repentance. Teach us to walk in the way You would have us walk. Help our light shine, Lord, and help us be useful in Your kingdom that we might serve the purpose for which You redeemed us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.